Accessibility. <laughs> Hi. It's Jenna. Oh, daddy, daddy. Everyone, our view. Here, I'll show you our view. I can't hear you, but I can see you. Can you hear me? Um, I can hear you, Shanti. Cool. Look at that. Um, you're in a way cooler spot than I am here in rainy Colorado. Yeah, that's Utah. Okay, that's a great start to the Zoom meeting. Maybe you should come see us. I think I should. And I think you should just come have your meetings here. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> All right, so it is five o'clock. We're going to start. I'm sure we'll see people filtering in. And now that we are off yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in replay, <laughs> People are that way, which is great. So we are Face Camp, Allie and I. We have some excellent guests with us this evening to talk about sponsorship pitches. And this might seem really similar to last week's chat, but last week we chatted a lot about influencers and ambassadorships. And now we're going to be rooting down into how to actually make that pitch, how to actually do those very tactical things that will get you noticed from brands, you know, what data to include, how much you should be asking for, where to start those conversations, how to build those relationships, things like that. So it's really like rooting down with folks that have either done this before really successfully or are kind of on the decision-making end of who to be uh, sponsoring. So we're super happy to have our guests today. We are going to ask them some questions that we generated from the list that you provided in the registration. And then after that, if you would like to ask a question directly, please use the raise your hand function in Zoom and we can uh, get you on stage. If not, we have a ton of questions. And I am also going to put some of our links in the chat. So if you'd like to follow us on Instagram or check out our last conversation on our website, you can do that very easily. So we will start out uh, with introductions. Sarah, if you wouldn't mind letting us know who you are and why you're on stage today. Sure. Hello, everyone. Excited to be here. I've been a big Basecamp fan for many years now. Um, so I started a company called Outdoor Fest in New York City in 2014. It's a 10-day outdoor adventure festival, so live event um, big camp out that kind of launched it. And so we have sponsorships for that on the ground. And then I also have a company called Mappy Hour and Mappy Hour is a community of urban dwelling outdoor enthusiasts. And we have both a digital platform as well as offline events. So it gets to kind of mix and match a little bit with sponsors there and, uh, have sponsors for that as well. So lots of time spent talking, pitching, and sometimes closing sponsors. <laughs> Shanti in a really cool place right now. Oh, less cool. Hi. Okay. Now we're in our car driving on a four wheel drive road. I wish you guys could see. So let me see if I can get you all out there. Um, I'm Shanti. I'm the founder of Hike It Baby. And um, I started it when this guy was born to get families out hiking for the five year olds. We live in. Mason. His name is Mason. I, 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 was, that, I was the starting of Hike It Baby. <laughs> and we um we started as a small little nonprofit or well first as just a group to get people out hiking with kids and then we had to start uh, we lived in Portland Oregon we had to start raising money because we were really quickly realizing how big it was getting and it spread across the country and actually to a few countries around the world and we had to we spent a lot of time building up we started in 2013 and um, yeah, and so I'd love to share some of the insight of what we saw, what we've seen happen over the years with sponsorship. And we're in, we live in Zion National Park area. Wicked, excited to hear that. And Campbell. Hi everybody, I'm Campbell. Um, I'm VP uh, at Hi. Turner uh, Public Relations. Um, I'm based in Colorado as well. We don't have rain right now. It's uh, very snowy here. We already have about a foot of snow, which is kind of wild. Um, and um, what I bring to the conversation is uh, we get pitched 
um, sponsorships um, all the time um, via uh, people who are looking for money for sponsorships and then influencers. Um, we get between like five and 30 a day, believe it or not, um, which is pretty wild because we work with uh, brands like REI, Leatherman, um, Takea, um, Red Wing. Um, and then on the destination side, we work with tons of um, like destinations. So the state of Wisconsin, South Carolina, Chile and South America, Bermuda, um, sort of all over the place. And my specialty is pitching. Um, and so I can help sort of guide you in terms of the pitching process, what is basically going to get your email opened, um, which is kind of the first step of, of these things. And so I'm looking forward to connecting with everybody. Also Toronto, the best city in the world. Um, okay, Campbell, we're going to dive right in there first then. I would love to know, that wasn't even part of our question, but okay, how do you get that email open first of all? And then also, what information are you going to need to include in that first email and in maybe a pitch deck if you're including it to actually get a yes from a decision maker who's reading that pitch? Totally. It, it's, I mean, and it, I think that's a, it's a key question. And so like what I'm looking for um, and not to just delete an email right away is um, personalization is everything. So like why me, like why this organization, why have you come to me today for the sponsorship opportunity? Um, you would be surprised or maybe you wouldn't, I don't know. A lot of folks use form pitches. And so um, that is like the no-no in the industry. Anytime I see a form pitch, it just like, I get like emotional, just like sad, basically. I'm like, oh, like, you know, whereas if somebody has written the like, here's why I'm reaching out to you today, um, like a personally tailored sort of message. This is why I align with your organization. And obviously like connection on a personal level is key. So why specifically you want to work with this brand? Um, I would recommend being human, um, use inspiration, of course, um, why something matters to you or better yet, why it aligns with your personal beliefs. Um, and then always consider your competition. There are a lot of people pitching the same things. And so I think about that every time I send a pitch, how do I sort of stand up above sort of the crowd? So always consider your competition. And with, with that in mind, you know, the subject line is really important. So you can use humor in a subject line to get it open, but ideally it sort of encompasses what you're looking for in one sentence. And then I like to be able to see what your ask is literally in the first sentence. So like why you went to me is like, that's the personalization I'm looking for. And then I want to see next, like, what do you want really quick? And then I read on. If I don't get those things, a lot of times I delete them. And then, yeah, you mentioned Jenna as well. Measurement is key. Um, you know, in the email, I'm always looking, you know, I always want to know like what the audience is, you know, if there's an engagement rate, great, you know, what the demographic is. And I'm looking to see if those align with the brand, basically. Okay. What about things like what they're asking for payment wise? Does that need to be in the very first email? It doesn't, you know, sometimes it doesn't actually. So it, it, it would be nice to know sort of what the buy-in is. That's a lot of times that's going to be the next question I'm going to ask because sometimes that is an eliminator, right? If it's, it's, if it's a crazy amount of money, if it's above a brand sort of need, then yeah, you know, I think, I think it is good to have examples of like what you're looking for specifically. Again, the more specific you can get, the better. It's not like a total turnoff if it's not in there, if I feel like it's something that really aligns with us. But yeah, I mean, I would like to know sort of what you're asking for ideally, if possible. Shanti, please let us know what you're thinking. Hi, I was just wanting to bring in like as a uh, nonprofit, a small nonprofit going out after funders, we found we didn't just throw numbers out at people right away because starting the conversation and creating the relationship was a lot more important we found um, and really seeing if you vibe with like there's marketing directors that we met with that we just were like we could tell right away we didn't even want to get into that conversation with them we weren't interested in they, oh. they just had a blank look in their eye with us Got it. so I think you start to know it's nice sometimes to create a relationship first I think with someone yeah so Shanti um you mentioned that you talked to marketing directors I'm just wondering as you know for somebody who has never pitched we hear that it's through PR, we hear that it's through marketing, kind of, is there any sort of like clear path? Should it be marketing? Should it be PR? Is it all of the above? Is there anyone else that we're not thinking of maybe that should be pitched internally? Yeah, yeah actually go to other people that they're working with, like influencers that you're friends with and people like we would go to other companies that we knew didn't feel like threatened by us going out because we were kind of filling different buckets for that company. 
and we would work with them to help, you know, we would, you know, so that was one thing is like just other key other companies and then find out who internally, like if there's, um, I mean, we often, gosh, we went in a lot of different routes, be it like art directors that really liked what we were doing and had a baby, or we'd hear someone in the company just had a baby and we were hiking a baby. We'd reach out and send them a shirt or a sticker and be like, Hey, get to know us before we even, if it was a company we wanted to be involved with before we even started down the road of going to a marketing director, who's very busy and getting thousands of pitches a day. Totally. I would agree with that. Like find your champion, like in the organization. Yeah. And like, once you find that person and you're, I, I agree 100%, that person is going to be an advocate for you because they yep. sort of align with the same things. And um, I, I agree with all of that. I think that makes perfect that, sense. Like for us, in the case of Deuter, for example, we went to Becky and I connected with her just personally. We just really hit it off and we really liked each other. And she was at Deuter at the time. She's not anymore. She's at Solomon now. And it was just so easy to talk with her about what we were looking for instead of like coming in the hard and fast, like, here's my marketing pitch for you. Um, and then I ended up hanging out there and she's like still a great friend to this day. Like now we have an eight year friendship out of this initial, like, I think Deuter would be a great fit for us because they have baby carriers. So Sarah, I'd love you to hop in here. Same sort of conversation though. Like, how do you build these relationships? Because you know, Shanti was saying she just made friends with people, which is kind of what I like to do too, just build an actual relationship, but how, you know, not even that is simple. So how do you, where do you start? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. And I didn't jump into it cause I felt like Shanti and Campbell were covering it all. Uh, loved all those tips. Definitely numbers is something I've heard from a lot of potential sponsors, like get the numbers in the pitch. If you can the like first pitch, um, in terms of the relationship building, I did something similar where it was trying to find the advocate. So especially because I was in New York City and a lot of these brands are out West, I tried to connect with people on the ground. So definitely some PR people uh, based in New York, Turner team um, in part. There are store managers. There are people that are really excited about being in, in New York City and want to share that um, with the greater world, including the outdoor industry. So for me, it was a lot of showing up and trying to meet people and telling them what I was about and expressing my vision. And people got excited about that. And I was able to build relationships from there and then find the, the right contacts who actually had budget and get connected with the marketing team. So when you're saying like, so you introduced them to what you were doing, were you just like, Hey, here's what I'm building and just talked about it. Were you like, here's what I'm building and here's how you can get involved. Like what? Oh yes, definitely. Here's what I'm building. How do we get you involved? What do you want? And I think that's like, I mean, with any good partnership, it's like, how can we do this where you get a lot of value out of, out of it as well. So the first year I did outdoor fest, it was just like, how can I bring on every single partner in New York city in a way that adds value to them? And it was wild and crazy, uh, but it happened. And that's where a lot of the relationships happened. And I will say also like, I made no money my first year. I was like bleeding money. <laughs> um, and I made up for that the second year because our numbers the first year were so good, but like it did, it was like a commitment to showing up for the partners and showing them that I could do a good job. And I think, I think there's going to be a question later on how you do that. But like, I think if you can, show that you're true to your word, right? If you say, I'm going to deliver, let's say like it's a, a retail partnership. I'm going to bring 50 people into your store. Actually, this is a good Turner example. We worked with, um, I worked with someone from Turner. The All Raven was a client then for our first Mappy Hour. And it was like, I'm going to bring 40 people in store. We brought 60, right? I mean, this is like a, a minor thing, but like showing that you can do what you say you're going to do is just like a really great way to kind of put some meaning behind the words and behind um the the business partnership beyond the the relationship yeah i'd say reliability is probably one of the key metrics right like if i want to work with someone it's not necessarily like who's the best but like who do i know will do this in yeah. the line and uh that's the person that i call so um yeah, yeah figuring out how to show that you're reliable yeah. but yeah. i'm super curious if you were to do it again in that first year, do you think you could have made money if you shifted something? It's a great question. Um, I mean, it was definitely a, a tough position. Um, I had never been in the outdoor, like, you know, sponsorship or pitching world before. And I didn't have a lot of, um, 
I don't know what the word is. Like I didn't have a lot behind my name. Right. Um, and this was like a completely new idea. It was kind of crazy. There were definitely brands that were like, you're not going to be able to do this. Like there were people who said that to me, um, and were concerned that I wouldn't be able to execute. And that's totally fair. I get it. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, I think the way I did it was okay. Like I took out a loan. I mean, this is getting into the business side of it. I took out a loan. I was able to pay that loan back within a year. Um, so I, you know, had the, the ability to do that. And I, I think it, it worked out for me, but I have, I am not sure a big brand would have invested in me that first year with, without being able to, to show something, some sort of like success metrics in the past. But maybe I'm not but, believing in myself. I don't know. I mean, maybe you need to believe in yourself more than that. But I, I do think that that is, uh, that is at least from what I've seen, like being able to show like your work is, is a really important part of getting a brand to trust you. So. Um, I was just going to add like numbers too. Don't worry about big numbers. Like that's the thing. What you had, Sarah, was really cool and it was different and unique. So pay attention to like, if what you have is really unique to what's out there, go for it. Because like, same thing for me with Hike It Baby, like, we didn't, you know, we, we were doing something no one was doing at that point. Yeah. Campbell, I'm curious what you think about that too. I, yeah, I mean, two things like really resonated with me that Sarah said actually. So like one was she mentioned like, so long-term relationships is something to keep in mind. Like the last thing a brand wants right now. And I think ever for that matter, but definitely right now is like a one and done kind of thing. Like, you know, we, we consider like narrative arcs for like one, three, four, five years, you know, and longer. And so like it, when we enter into sort of sponsorship kind of stuff like this, we're looking at like the arc of three to five years, ideally if possible. And so um, I wouldn't limit yourself to saying, you know, I need this amount of money to get going because you're almost shortchanging yourself. You should be looking at it like, this is where I want to go. And I think, you know, sharing that with the organization is in your best interest because, you know, it might align really well with their goals. And then it might get you sort of filled in on their own marketing strategy in terms of where they're going as well. And then I think another thing that was really smart that Sarah said as well is research understanding like the ins and outs of the organization that you're going to. I can tell you that somebody that comes to me and clearly knows like everything going on with, you know, whether it's, you know, REI or, or whatever the client is, Red Wing, um, Leatherman, um, right away, I'm like, this person knows this brand. They clearly did their research. They clearly like aren't calling 10 different um, companies. Even if they are, I feel like I'm sort of the only one, kind of like that dating thing. Like I'm the one you want, like that's what we want to hear. And so whether that's true or not. And so research goes into that, you know, tenfold. So I think that's really smart. When you say that, do you mean like, so you're researching for things like, speaking like the brand, knowing their values, knowing kind of, you know, maybe what their goals are and how you can help them. Or is there something else that you're throwing in? Yeah. Like how you can help them. Like what, like if you've noticed like marketing campaigns, if there's, if there's like certain audiences or demographics that you've noticed that they're going after and that aligns with what you're doing or what your sponsorship mission is, or, you know, all that stuff I think goes into sort of the de decision process in terms of whether we align well. And so, so yeah, just like knowing the ins and outs and that, that doesn't like, obviously there's no way you can know what's going on like internally in an organization in terms of sort of a marketing plan, but you can see what's going on in terms of where they're spending their dollars. And so, um, you know, it's really easy to like have a fine eye for, I see that you're advertising here. Or I see that you're doing this, or I see you, that you partnered with this organization in this region of the country. And so that is sort of a fine eye to like where the dollars are going. Yeah. Well that, and then it's also proving that you want to work with that company. You're not just like you said, throwing out the same pitch to a bunch of email addresses, um, which sounds efficient, but yeah, it's, it's kind of like if you're doing that to jobs and you're not tailoring your cover letter, it's probably not going to be as fruitful as, you know, a different approach. Um, Serene also, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to add. So like, especially that first year I, I did invest a lot, like in getting, um, in kind support which is a really great way to start a relationship and can offer a lot of value to an organization, whether it is like product or promotional support, whatever it is, like something you can take, you know, a line item, item off your budget because a brand is able to support it. It doesn't cost them as much. And that's a great way to just like get started with a relationship if you're able to do that. Yeah. I call that like dipping a toe. Like sometimes <laughs> like a brand isn't going to give you like 
a million dollars or even ten thousand dollars, but they yeah. might give you some product to see how yeah. it does, like what happens. And so we call that dipping a toe just to like see what happens. And if it goes well, then the conversation continues to the next level. Yeah. yeah like a little proof of concept kind of thing. Yeah, we did that a lot in the beginning. We had the hike at maybe 30, which was a challenge. And we would just ask companies for product, not even for any money, just to do the challenge. And we gave tons of stuff away again at the end of the year. And then people joined the challenge and paid five to ten dollars to do it. So that was a huge funder for us by just having that product. So you mean that the company is providing product paid you to provide that product? Is that what you mean? So yeah, companies gave us product and then we would give it away in the challenges that we did. And that made a huge, because we would make money for the challenges because it was a fundraiser for us. I see. And okay. so that was a lot easier to work with the company because they were just, they were like, oh yeah, sure. We can get you like 10 hats for that challenge. No problem. Well, yeah, because you have to put yourself in the shoes of who you're talking to, right? Because if there is a budget involved, sometimes they have to get approval for that budget. Sometimes they have mm -hmm. to fight for that budget. They only get a certain amount, right? So um, if you're not making them go through that step, um, it's probably a lot less friction. So, And then they would see all the social media we would do from it and the, the response they would get from people and how excited people were about getting and winning that product because we would throw a picture up of the person that won it. And that made a big difference, like really how you take that product and what you do with it matters. Yeah. So that's social proof. I, I mean, yeah. I think it's really smart. Serene, do you have a question or a comment perhaps? I mean, I always have comments, but I do have a question. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, thank, thank you all. This is super, super helpful. I'm really new to, um, really new to all this, but Jenna and I had a great conversation today. So I'm so glad I'm here. I had a question about what, what we're defining as sponsorship. Campbell, you were talking about it as sponsorship mission. Sarah and Shanti, you've both given great examples about like whether it's for an event or nonprofit or, or whatnot. But what, I mean, what is the full range? I know of some of it, like social media influencers and whatnot, but what are the types of things that get sponsored? Yeah, Campbell, Everything. I'd love you to... <laughs> to let us know like kind of the spectrum here because I think that there I think it's unlimited you could you can sponsor anything but <laughs> maybe some examples yeah I mean I think it really ranges in what your definition sort of a sponsorship is but I think I think you bring up a good interesting point because as Jenna and I were talking about like we're going back on email about this uh, about influencer as well like I consider like influencers a bit of a sponsorship as well because you're paying depending on how much you're paying them and whether you're paying for just travel and sort of on the ground sort of fees or whether you're paying them a fee you know oftentimes believe it or not that can add up to more than some of the sponsorships on uh, you know that we're thinking about because we do a lot of celebrity um sort of seating as well and sponsorships as well and so like i think of you know Bermuda, we, we, a celebrity is a big component of that. And so if you're bringing somebody there and they want to bring their family, you have to fly everybody first class, you know, from wherever they are, it could be up to 20 people. Um, and it just depends, it, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars just to have somebody come and, um, you know, tell their story while they're here. Like we had Yara Shahidi um, from Blackish in Bermuda and it was incredible. It was awesome. Um, but it wasn't anywhere near free, you know, but, um, you know, so I consider that sort of it, when I say consider your competition at the onset of this call, I, I, I think you bring up a really good point, Serene, because like your competition is really for dollars. And so anywhere dollars are going in terms of any of this is really your competition. So if you're just considering other people who are doing sort of in-kind sponsorships or sort of giving back to the community, or you have an org organization like Sarah is talking about where you're giving back to certain people and you're looking for sponsorship dollars for that, you really have to look at the whole spectrum in terms of where dollars are going. And I consider that all competition in terms of sort of pitching for these dollars, because typically I look at marketing budgets as like, buckets, right? And so there's only so much in the bucket and it's got to go to certain places. And a lot of times, you know, sponsorships are, they sort of work into the same marketing budget as influencers. It just depends on the organization. And so um, I guess the answer to your question is yes, it's all of those things. That's kind of a convoluted answer. Sorry. I, I want to add on to that because this is something that took me a little bit to figure out. Uh, kind of what Campbell's saying that there are different layers of everything. Like there's like the core marketing team for the brands. There's their PR company that represents them. Some brands have a separate marketing agency that's going to be doing marketing activations for them. Um, and so that is all part of the research process of figuring out 
who does what. And it is hard sometimes, but like, as you get more into the industry, it gets a little bit clearer because there are companies representing multiple brands and that will influence what you're pitching to who. So I don't know if that's helpful, but like, it is like a kind of a complex web of different companies that work together. And it's often hard to get to the right person. I think that's a really good point because, um, the other thing that's happening is advertisers are constantly knocking on your door saying, we want advertising dollars. And the last thing you want to do is go to like your partner sort of agency and be like, here you go. Like, here's an advertising person that's been, you know, heckling me for six months. And so um, sometimes your stuff gets forwarded. Sometimes it doesn't. That's the, that's the honest answer. But people help people they like. So it does go back to that relationship building thing in, in the beginning, right? Like, so Campbell, we're going to talk about being a Bermuda influencer later, I think, because <laughs> uh, that sounds fun and I don't need to be even first class. So Serene did that, like that expensive you. to fly us all there, you know? Oh yeah. I think everyone on <laughs> the chat could really go for like quite first a class. party for you. <laughs> Serene, did that answer your question? That did. Um, and I have a follow-up, but I, Justine has a question. So I will, Justine, please go first. Okay. Justine, what's up? Yeah, um, so I was just curious if you all had any thoughts on the kinds of sponsorships you're most excited about right now in terms of, is it social media? Is it events? Is it activation? And then also in addition to that, it's in terms of return on investment metrics, what should a person be keeping track of in order to prove or to show the value of the sponsorship? I, I used to just grab, do screen grabs of all kinds of stuff, seeing the product. I don't know if that, I mean, just like to just, I'd shoot it off to Becky in a moment, like, hey, look at this picture I just saw of the product that someone won. I mean, just really making it really personalized helps and, and but, you know, also really keeping track of those numbers that you have in Instagram, Facebook, um, you know, how many people are checking out what you gave away or what pro how the product is being used. I would I'm, say just ask. Oh, oh go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. I, I For my sponsorships, I am very um, upfront at the beginning when we're going through the whole contract phase of like, what do you want to see? What will make this a success? And then I like dig in because sometimes brands are not that good at like exactly expressing what they want. Like, oh, we want like engagement. And you're like, well, what exactly is engagement for you? And is that on social? Is that, you know, and just like dive in and find out from them like specifically what they want. Because in my experience, it's been different for every single brand. <laughs> no, no one has the exact same metrics that they're reporting internally. So I would just like probe as much as you can and get that information up front and then track it accordingly. We have contracts. I mean, we have contracts for everything. It's like if we're hosting anything for anyone or a sponsorship, it's, you know, you're signing onto a contract with agreed upon deliverables, you know, and then per your question about like things that we're excited about, um, it's not apples to apples, but like one thing I'm excited about right now, um, because we kind of dreamt it up was we represent Estes Park here in Colorado and it's more of an influencer play, but there's also some sort of sponsorship sides to it as well, but it's an athlete and residence program that we have up there. Um, it's basically, so we came up with this idea and this kind of gives you an idea of like how these marketing things come about. Sometimes we dreamt up the athlete and residence program because we wanted to sort of we were looking at other destinations like Jackson Hole, um, you know, Aspen, like Whistler, these adventure places. How do we put Estes Park on a level with these places? We're going to start this athlete and residence program, and we're going to bring athletes in to adventure here, and then they're going to broadcast it out to their channels and their marketing channels, and ideally they're sponsored by, you know, incredible companies that are also broadcasting it out. And so that's sort of an example of like how we come up with ideas and then how it goes back to, you know, sort of interesting sort of things. And so I, I use that example because you like somebody could come to one of our organizations, you know, a destination or a hotel or whatever with an idea like that. And if it aligned with our marketing principles, like, Hey, I see that you guys really are interested like in adventure and getting like younger people into this destination that seems to be aging out a little bit. Um, I have this idea, like I'm all ears. Like it, it could be something that I listen to. And so, um, you know, that's a good example of like, you never know, like your timing could be right to sort of hit an organization with an idea like that. Awesome. Thank you all for that. 
Serene, did you want to hop in with your other question? Yes. Um, I'm super curious actually to ask y'all this question now. So I don't know if you saw uh, last week, Backcountry announced an initiative called Breaking Trail, and it was all about inclusion and belonging in the outdoors. And um, it, uh, I had, there was a pretty glaring omission, I felt like, because there was no one in the AAPI community involved in this initiative. So I, I actually ended up doing some grassroots organizing and, um, and you know, we, we created a coalition letter of voices and allies from across the AAPI uh, outdoors community and sent a letter to the CMO of Backcountry uh, yesterday, actually, basically trying to hold some accountability and, and call it out, right? And it, it's been, um, and this is kind of similar to the conversation I have with Jenna earlier today, for me, it's been this huge learning curve of understanding, like, how to do this level, this type of grassroots advocacy. Um, and we'll see what Backcountry says, but I just feel like there's this huge opportunity um, cause I work in the equity inclusion space. Like we just announced the Mountaineers first equity inclusion strategy yesterday. And I'm really proud of that work. And I just feel like there are, there's not that much dialogue that I'm seeing in the outdoors industry about these issues. That's like at the level that I work in tech at the level that I've seen in the, in the private sector and would just love your thoughts there, you know, because I feel like there's just this huge opportunity and a need and a, um, and yeah, I'm just trying to, I, but I'm still, I'm so new to, to the industry in this way. Like I've always, I've worked with mountaineers for a while now, but I, um, yeah, those are the thoughts in my head right now in terms of just that intersection of, you know, the, social issues, justice, anti-racism, and how it reflects in what is still a very privileged white space. Yeah, so I mean, it's, I don't know that I have, like I, Jenna, I sent you an email a little bit about this, um, and I was talking about this a little bit, but um, I feel like, so one, I, I agree with you. I think every organization worth working with, in my opinion, of course, should have diversity goals that they're working toward. Um, and it definitely needs to include, you know, set percentages of BIPOC influencers, sponsorships, et cetera, et cetera, within strategies. It, we do here at Turner, um, that includes, you know, influencers, everything we do. And so, and we've published it. And I think that's important as well. Um, something I've seen on Basecamp as well. So calling out orgs that aren't doing this um, probably isn't going to be totally fruitful. And what, what you're saying is not calling them out by any means. I think what you're doing is exactly the right way to do it. Um, so like one way I've seen influencers do this really well is to reach out with a really like super well thought out pitch, which it sounds like you did. Um, like perhaps, like I noticed while auditing a brand, obviously more people notice this because it was pretty glaring um, or a destination or whatever. And just say, I didn't see myself represented and I, I can't be a brand steward for you, but then hit the brand with the proposition, here's how I can help you change this. And I think that is a great pitch. And if they don't answer that with a thoughtful response at the very least, then I think you have every right to be angry openly, you know? But I think, I, I think I've seen that work and I think that is a good strategy in my opinion. Um, it's just, you know, as I said, do your research and as you're auditing, and it may not be like uh, uh, what they thought was an, a well-intentioned sort of advertising strategy, you know, but that, I think that's really smart. Yeah. Um, can you folks, Campbell as well, definitely let us know if there's any like topics, I guess, that are really exciting or feel like companies are super into them right now? Or is that something that like, does that ebb and flow? Are there trends in this domain that people could try to follow? And then follow-up question, sort of, if it is a topic that is not like sexy, if you will, what can you do? How can you get a yes? I mean, I think inclusion is like the biggest one for me. I just think like the outdoors obviously belong to everyone. And this, I mean, I'm obviously a white male, like, you know, and so, but like if companies are serious about, you know, 
inclusion and getting a lot of people out there. And, and the bottom line is this, like improving their bottom line and getting more people outdoors and selling more product and, you know, or whatever you do, um, then I think that's got to be the number one thing right now. And then, I mean, secondly, for me is the environment. You know, there's a lot of things that we do that are really with odds with the earth, you know, mother earth, like what is going on around us. I think, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is skiing. Um, I saw an op-ed yesterday by um, the CEO of the Aspen Skiing Company and full disclosure, I used to represent the Aspen Skiing Company. And so this probably isn't a popular um, opinion, but um, I think offsetting your carbon credits and like building a bunch of solar, like, you know, farms and such um, is not a good answer to sort of the environment for the ski industry. The ski industry is, is, is an offender of this. You know, I, I think the future of skiing to me is, is probably in the back country and doing it in a safe way. And, you know, there's companies that are doing that right now. That's like bluebird back country and such. And so I think it's taking a hard look at, and they're never going to say that obviously because they're huge money makers and they're churning money out. And so I think it's taking a hard look at like, really what the future of these things are going to be because the, the bottom line is if it stops snowing then you're not going to be in business anymore so a lot of these places i think are making as much money as they possibly can before you know they're reading the writing on the wall that's just my opinion of course but so you know i think inclusion and the environment are the two big ones for me and 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 on a personal level it, it's it's getting young people um enamored and in love with the outdoors Awesome. Thank you for telling us the sort of hot topics right now around the industry and um, areas that are kind of getting sponsorship dollars, I think is, is what that pointed to. Um, Sarah, I know that you, I wanted to ask this question. We haven't asked it yet, sort of a little off topic from what we were just saying, but I know you just nabbed a really awesome sponsorship that's sort of outdoor adjacent. And I want to hear a little bit about that journey. How did you navigate that? Who did you know to contact? Um, tell us about that. Um, sure. Yeah. So uh, I was telling Anne and Jenna that this morning I signed a contract with Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Um, they're based in California, but yeah, very exciting. Um, uh, but they, they obviously have representation, like, uh, you know, their marketing team on the, the East Coast. And so I think honestly, it's like not that interesting. It's kind of the same thing. Like I cold pitched them in 2015. Um, they came to one event with some beer. That was the, you know, that was the partnership. They loved it. And I've been building a relationship with them every year. And, you know, at first it was just New York city. Then it was the whole Northeast. And the one this morning is a national partnership. So it was really, really slow and incremental. This is like a five-year project. Um, but, you know, I think it, it really was about, you know, showing up, building trust, you know, like um, really getting to know their brand and what's important to them. And I think, you know, that's, that's part of it. And also like the working relationship. So like, um, they, and I think there was a question before on like, what, do, what is exciting about partnerships for, for me, it's like a brand that allows Mappy Hour to do its thing and to, you know, live our values as well. And doesn't try to be like too overarching. And I think that's like where we're perfectly fit because they want to support the things that we're excited about. And we, you know, I, we figured out how to tie in their brands to that. So yeah, I guess like just to wrap that up just about like really again, like getting to know the brand, um, creating those relationships and um, hopefully like, yeah, creativity and just being excited about um, what the outdoors can can provide for, for everyone um, was I guess the, the secret sauce for that one. So smart too. Like, I think yeah. like we talk about, like this is obviously a group on the outdoors and like we're constantly talking about like REI and the North Face and Patagonia and like but like there's tons of organizations like that that are like passionate about the outdoors and um, are, are maybe getting pitched a little less. And so I think that is a that's an incredible example, like super smart. Yeah, that's also think something I'll bring up. Oh, sorry. We, we went out after a lot of non outdoors to like the health industry and things that you're not thinking about if you're an organization like, you know, in Sarah's case, I mean, that makes total sense that she would go after an alcohol company because they're they're it's a happy hour it makes total sense a happy hour um and for us you know we went out after uh you know we were going for diaper brands and second generation and all these different or seventh generation sorry all those kind of things outside and so that's something to, to consider don't just focus on the outdoor brands because they have a lot smaller budgets than these bigger companies 
Yeah, and like I was gonna say as well, like we work with some liquor brands, and so like we represent Stillhouse Spirits, which is owned by Bacardi, um, and they I, I don't know if you guys know Stillhouse, but it comes in sort of like a flask basically, and their whole focus is put it in your backpack, take it with you into the back country. And so um, Sierra Nevada is a perfect example, like same kind of thing, like these industry sort of adjacent things that like they want the exact same audience. And so sometimes it's not thinking like so literally like straight down the line of these places and sort of opening your eyes to sort of a greater sort of good. Like we also work with mind body. Mind body is if you've ever booked a yoga class um, or any kind of class for that matter, they're like the platform that books it. You know, they sold for a couple of years ago for like $2 billion. And so um, there's a lot of money in these things. So I think it's, it's broadening sort of what you're looking at and who has dollars. Nice, yeah. And I like Sarah's example too, for, for two reasons. One, it's, it takes time, it can be slow. It's a, it's a relationship that you're building over time. And then two, thinking from the marketing people's point of view, um, you know, you're sort of fostering those handful of relationships over here. And then they are also fostering that relationship with you. And it's, they don't always have a lot of time to go find new avenues so that that relationship is important to them as well. Um, so that's just a really great example there. Thank you, everyone. I think we're at the end of our conversation. Um, but this was so helpful. So many amazing tangible takeaways. Um, I'm really excited that we had this, that we've recorded it, that we can share it out and, um, you know, listen to it again and get those takeaways one more time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to our speakers, Campbell, Sarah, Shanti, you were awesome. And we will see you in base camp. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.